Hi, folks. I'm Rich Folley, and we're back at the Library of Congress National Book Festival, coverage by PBS Books. I'm Rich Folley, and I'm happy to be sitting right now with Leila Lilami, who's the author, most recently, of The Other Americans, also The Moore's Account and others. But this book is a really wonderful book. I want to talk to you about it, but I want to welcome you first. It's so nice to have you. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, we're in the middle of this amazing book festival where you get to meet all these readers, other people like you. Do you do other festivals like this? I do, but I, I have to say this is one of my favorite festivals. I just find it so inspiring to see such large crowds gathered yeah. in one place to talk about books. So it's it is wonderful. really amazing. Yeah. I mean, everybody in one place. These are our yeah. people. Yes. And like we all I get to always, like commune. I always say book people are my people. So. <laughs> yes. Well, this is an interesting book for you because this one actually takes place in the United States, in California, yes. in uh, all places, the California desert. Yes. And it's a, it's a large cast of characters. It's a little bit of a, of a murder mystery on top of a story of immigrants and, and others that have come to this country or that are American-born, but it's an interesting combination for you mm -hmm. and a different one than some of your previous books. Can you talk yeah. to me about how the story came about? And first of all, why, why California desert, which yes. isn't what people know, would normally think of for a setting like this. Yeah, so I've been living in California for well over 20 years, and I felt like the time had come to set a book there. I wrote about the desert because, much to my surprise, I've been drawn to that landscape. I really, I've always lived in big cities, and I never thought of myself as sort of a desert kind of person. And then about eight or nine years ago, my husband and I started going out to Joshua Tree and to the Mojave Desert more generally. And something about that landscape spoke to me. And I just love the silence and the big open spaces and the fact that you have to really pay very close attention to see kind of life uh, thrumming right beneath the surface. And so I decided to set the book there. And the book basically is centered around a Moroccan immigrant who dies under somewhat suspicious circumstances. And the inspiration basically came from my um, own life where, you know, a few years ago, I received a text in the middle of the night saying that my father had taken ill and that he was in the hospital and he was basically dying. And I, it, you know, it's that moment that every immigrant fears where you're going to receive bad news and you're going to be scrambling to travel thousands of miles away to be with your loved ones. And so we went to Morocco uh, to be with him. And very fortunately, thanks to the miracles of modern science, he survived and he's fine. He's sharp as a tack. He's, you know, he's 82 and, and just an amazing person. But that fear is what I wanted to explore in the book and to explore sort of the un unintended um, uh, consequences of immigration. So even when you immigrate under the best of circumstances, there's going to be some unintended things that happen and that you don't think about when, when you immigrate. And so the book starts with the death of this man who immigrated to America. And... Uh, is told from the perspective of different people who are connected to him. His family, of course, uh, but also the detective who's investigating the, the accident. It's a hit and run. Uh, a witness, uh, the neighbor. So it's kind of telling that story through multiple perspectives. Yeah, so the idea of separation, that separation that you talk about, you can really feel that. It's like an important thing, obviously, for, your, for you. It, the, the miles just kind of multiply as you yes. think about like a, a trauma, a crisis yes. like that. Yes, yes. And the fact that you're not in, a, in with all of your family at one time, yeah. that's just something that, that people who don't, who aren't, who haven't migrated to another country or live in another country would never really be able to understand. Yeah. And that's part of that sort of sense of empathy that you're building, this, this separation yes. that all immigrants feel yes. from their culture, from their families, from the people that they grew up with, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I I've became an immigrant by chance. I, I met the man who's now my husband 20 years ago. And, you know, you're when you're young and you're, you know, drunk on love and you, you know, decide to make a decision to immigrate to this country to be with this person, you don't think about what's going to happen as the years pass. My parents are getting older. Uh, it's just difficult for me that I'm not around every day to help them with whatever they need. You know, my, you know, just that sense of separation is not easy. The fact that my daughter, for example, is growing 6,000 miles away from her grandparents, on, at least on that side. So it's, you know, these are some of the unintended consequences of immigrating. And I think that even under the best of circumstances, the journey of immigration carries that risk and that sense of dislocation. 
Yeah, and the I, the the notion of the of the of the murder or, or of the, uh, the the suspicious yeah. death. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th- this this mystery that that pervades the book as well is another layer on the book, which felt like new for you. Yes. Can you talk about exploring the the whole new kind of genre of yeah. play for you, yeah. just to kind of spice things up as a writer for yourself? Yeah, I well, I it, the idea for the book was that it would be about this woman who has to return home because she hears that her father has died in this accident. And at first, that's all it was. It was an accident. But then as I started working on the book, I thought it might make it more interesting if there was... Uh, a mystery around it. And I, when I was a teenager, I used to read a lot of mystery and crime and detective stories. So it was kind of almost a nice thing for me to do with this book to kind of explore how to build a mystery. I had never done that before with any of my other books. Um, So I went back and I read a lot of other uh, crime novels to kind of figure out how to do it, how to build suspense in in the book. Um, And so the advantage of doing it as a mystery is that in telling each, it, it allowed me um, to tell the story from multiple perspectives and to uh, um, kick the story in many different directions. So for example, it is the story of, of an immigrant and in that sense it explores immigration, but it's also a story of grief because the family is trying to cope with the death of essentially the family patriarch. It's a love story because the young woman who returns home to the Mojave starts a new relationship with somebody. And so it's, it's, it's a family story, of course. So it's multiple stories. And in the, in, in the, the um, canvas of mystery allows for doing all of that. And so right many about, points of yeah, view and so yeah. many characters. Nine yeah. Different, yes. I think. So, I mean, you, you don't mess around when you decide to like throw in some new twists for your yes. writing. Yeah. And like, that's a lot of different points of view to play with at yeah. one time. Yeah. But must have been really fun for you to kind of explore and, and to was. like go into everyone's heads. It was. It really, like, writing this book from, you know, from an artistic perspective, it was just such a joy because it was something I had never done before. I'd written from the first person perspective, but not from nine all at once. So, it was just a good exercise it was something for me that it was new and I got to play with it and have fun with it and look for ways to make each voice a little bit different and to have each character have their own individual concerns their own private concerns um it just it was just a great experience from start to finish yeah, yeah. so your father uh who is fine yes 82 <laughs> he's a club, uh is in Thank Morocco God. Uh-huh. where you're from. Yes. C- can you talk a little bit about just your life in Morocco and then the transition to the United States? You, you said you were chasing love and you're with your husband now and, <laughs> and it all felt like very natural. Yeah. But now you're feeling like pangs, different pangs. Yeah. That, that evolving nature of, of a story of someone who's come to the United States or left their home. Yeah. I'm curious about that and how it's affected you as a writer as well. I mean, I think that it's sort of a, a timeless human experience. Like the, the the experience of being from one place and moving to another is just part of what it is to be a human being. And people move for all sorts of reasons. In my case, it's a very happy reason, right? But there are all kinds of reasons why people choose to move from one place to another. Sometimes they're driven to move from one place to another. Um, so to me, it's a, just a very human experience, mm-hmm. the immigration experience. So in my case, I was born and raised in Morocco. Um, and I, as I said, I really had no intention of immigrating to this country. I, I, I wanted to finish a degree here and then go back to Morocco and work as a college professor. And then, of course, life intervened. So yes, as it does. <laughs> yeah. I, the other thing I'm always curious about is that right now we talk a lot about immigration stories and we use the word immigration a yes, lot. Yes. When will these stories that are becoming more and more normal American stories not necessarily be called immigration stories, but just American stories? Because this is this mosaic now. I mean, we're talking about uh, Maria Rana was here earlier today oh. and she talked about 30 percent. I think we're looking at 30 percent of, of Americans will be uh, from Latin American countries at some point soon. Spanish-speaking American, Latin right, American countries. Right. And that's one in three people. That's one in three people in, in your circle, my circle, will be yes. with that background. Absolutely. At what point is this just America? And this yeah. isn't an immigration story anymore. It's just who we are. 
Well, I mean, I think it's very important to remember that unless you're an indigenous person um, or unless you're a descendant of an enslaved person, then your roots are immigrant roots in right. this country. That means that your parents, if not you and not your parents, then your grandparents. That's what I'm something. saying. Like, we don't talk about my parents' <laughs> yes. immigration stories. Yes. You know, like they may have come from Germany to two generations ago, right? but it's not an immigration story on yes. my side. Why is it different for you and the stories you write? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just because there is this, thing, this distinction between people who are born here versus people who came here, whether no. it's children or adults, and I think that's where we draw the line, but the reality is, is that this is a country of immigrants, as I said, unless you're indigenous or a descendant of, a, of an enslaved person. So I think it's really important to view the immigration experience as an American experience and to, to essentially normalize it because it is it is yeah. normal mm -hmm. i agree and then then you hear people like go back home even though they're american oh citizens are born in the united states or maybe even their parents are born in the united states yes. if you don't like it go back home oh and yeah this that's is home so you know this is what i, I guess is my my point well, i mean know? yes but i mean uh, so earlier you had uh henry louis gates talking about sort of white supremacy and all of that and the whole root of of go back home is in that it's basically saying that unless you're white your citizenship is essentially contingent, it's conditional, it's not really fully established because somebody is liable to say to you, go back, if you don't like it, go back home. So, and we've heard uh, those things from, from many different places in the last uh, few years. So. Yeah, and I feel that in the United States, there's a, I had a son that was in Morocco, but he's also in Tanzania, and Africa is this giant continent yes. with so many different cultures and, and people. and. Um, it's not Africa, the singular nation. It is, it is so diverse it and is. so different. Yes. And and I remember we had um, uh, Lavia J on here. She's from Nigeria, and she's like, "Well, just remember, I'm Nigerian." You know, like <laughs> a, I don't know exactly what that meant, but I know that it meant something to her very yeah. definitively, and that Africa is truly a nation of multiple parts and yeah. pieces. It is a massive place. It's a massive continent. It's yes. very big, very diverse, very beautiful. All different yeah. cultures that yes. come from. And Morocco <laughs> is so different from the others for of that course. matter. Yeah. Each one is very unique. Yeah. Yeah. So have you now that your father is you've had that scare, is there ever the desire to go back and to move and to live in well, I can't now because obviously I've. <laughs> yeah, you have a career in and a yeah, life. Yeah, and I, yeah, yeah. Well, and also, you know, the, you know, my kid is in school and all that. But but we do visit and, yeah. and we do see him and and we, we we keep that relationship going as much as we. Yeah. As we can. Yeah. So the Moors account before this. The, all the, all of your stories have some thread of immigration, obviously yes. involved in them. Can you talk a little bit about the the transition from Moors account, which was a wonderful book. Oh, thank you. And uh, an award-winning book and. So many uh, people love that. That's how I got to know you. Um, yeah, but that transition from that book to this book and, and, the, and the way you think about how you want to tell your story. Well, with the Moore's account, the book came to me almost right away when I was uh, reading a book about 16th century Spain. And I came across this mention of uh, a man that they called Estebanico, who was a, an enslaved Moroccan who had been brought here in 1528 with a Spanish expedition. And I, you know, and he was part of Cabeza de Vaca's party, and I wondered why I had never heard of him, and I had the idea of writing a book from his perspective, telling the story of that expedition. And after working on that book for five years and doing so much research, uh, archival research and historical research, I felt yeah. I needed a break. I need to be able to I, make some stuff <laughs> up and not have to worry. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And so I, I, I wanted to do something set in the here and in the now. Yeah. And Immediately after I turned in the copy edits for that book, I went on vacation, and that's when I had that text. Did it come I, that fast, like you knew you were going to do the next book almost immediately? Well, it's because life intervened, as I said, and I heard about, you know, my father, father. being sick. And so that, and I, you know, it was at that moment in between books, and I didn't know what I was going to work on, and that's where the idea came about. And then, of course, imagination steps in, and then it becomes... A mystery then suddenly we have you know this, this whole witness and the detective and it becomes its own thing but but that initial kernel of inspiration came from that text in the middle of the night so I'm curious about that kernel of inspiration this idea that like is you're constantly seeing things and yeah. noticing things and paying attention to things you're a storyteller that's just, just what you do yeah but but some kernels stick and yeah you decide to dedicate your life to writing yeah. that kernel. Yes, and it's several years. Fleshing that right? out, yes, yes. like taffy and pulling it out. I mean, what is it you think about some of those kernels that just say, this is the one that implants and stick? 
You know, it's just whether the idea stays with you. So, for example, with the Morse account, when I read this mention of Estebanico, or the man they called Estebanico, I thought it would make a fabulous novel. And I frankly did not know whether I had the, the, the patience, the talent, the time to do that story. But it just wouldn't let go of me. I just thought the idea yeah. was too good to pass up. And that's when I knew that I was just going to take a risk and do it. And with this book, it was just, again, that experience and that fear and that it just that's all I thought about that summer. And I it just wouldn't let go of me. And I thought, you know, there might be something I could work on uh, for the next book. Yeah, it's fascinating, the creative minds of the writers <laughs> and what how things come and go and uh and you're no different. It's just fascinating to talk to you. And the, your book, The Other Americans, a really wonderful addition mm -hmm. to your work. I'm so glad. I love Thank it so felt much. like such a departure, and yet it also really felt like you. And I can, uh. I can feel that in there. And I love that you can kind of play and explore but still have your imprint on a book like that, which says a lot about your style, oh, I think. Oh, thank you so, so much. It was really wonderful. Leila Lilami, the book is The Other Americans. Thank you so much for making thank time for us. Much. And for being at the National Book Festival thank as well. Thank you so much for having yeah. me. Great to meet you.